Three Winters Cold by Rev. Philip Crosby Chapter 2 Under the Red Star June 29th to July 6th, 1950 By sunrise on Thursday, July 29th, I had offered Mass, taken breakfast and settled down to await the Reds' arrival. I thought they would come with the daylight, but the morning wore on and they did not appear. Waiting with, waiting with me were Susanna, Rosa and the carpenter. The outside man had gone off at an early hour to see how his family was faring, intending to return before night. Around 10 o'clock, some so South Korean vehicles towing artillery came racing down the road from Chuncheon. Just below the church, they turned off into a field and presently their guns were went into action, hurtling shells back along the road. If the enemy got if the enemy got the range, shells would begin falling near the church. So I sent the women to the cellar under the kitchen which had been made ready for such an emergency. The artillery men, however, were soon on the move again. Not long afterwards, a thunderous detonation from the southern end of the town suggested that they had crossed the river there and blown up the bridge behind them, and that suggested that theirs had been the long motorised unit defending the town. We saw no other troops till after lunch, when a group of southern soldiers carrying a motor came down the other road from the northern and east. They set up their mortar in the field beside the church and fired at the enemy for a short time. Then they too moved on south through the town. After that, there fell a profound silence, broken only by sporadic rifle fire in the hills. A stillness of death was on the town. A few old and feeble folk remained, but most of the homes were deserted. The carpenter and I were chatting quietly in the workshop when, about four o'clock, we heard a barked command from the direction of the back gate. Peering through the cracks in the wall, we saw a score of soldiers filing in from the lane that ran behind the church. They're soldiers from the north, the carpenter whispered. We've seen prisoners who were captured in some of the border incidents, and I know the uniform. The uniform was distinctive enough, baggy trousers, shirt-like jacket tucked in at the waist, cylindrical peaked caps adorned with the red star. We'd better go and meet them, I said, and began to move. But the carpenter, wiser than I, laid a restraining hand on my arm. Not yet, he whispered. These men will pass on and will meet those who come later. They filed past within a few feet of where we watched them, through the chinks in the wall. Tense and alert, they darted curious glances all around them. As they passed, I saw how the leafy branches they wore for camouflage were held by loose stitches of string sewn into the shoulders of their jackets. The majority carried rifles of Russian type and bayonets long and fluted. Some had submachine guns. A large stone came go- crashing through the window of the workshop. Shattered glass fell near us on the cement fo- floor. We held our breath, but without further incident, the group passed on. As the sound of their footsteps faded, the carpenter and I exchanged a nod that expressed quite adequately the oneness of, a one tho- of our thought. We had just passed, in a matter of seconds, from one world to another, by merely standing still. Before very long there came the tramp of many feet and a large body of troops turned into the church grounds. It was some comfort to deduce from the sound that their easy chatter these were men far less tense than those who had come before. We heard feet ascending the steps to the kitchen door then a loud knocking. Leaving the carpenter in the workshop I passed through the kitchen and went to unlock the door. All right, I called. I'm opening the door. Outside stood an officer flanked by two of his men. Below, at the foot of the steps, more soldiers were crowding. 
with the best of intentions and as pleasantly as I could, I said as I stepped out to meet the officers, take it easy, there's no danger here. Either he was determined not to be friendly or my manner piqued him. He drew his pistol and levelled it. Down below, half a dozen of soldiers fell in line and flung up their rifles. Who's talking about danger? The officer snapped. Put up your hands. I raised my hands. Then question came. What place was this? Who was I? What was my name? My nationality? How many people were on the premises? Who were they? Where were they? I gave replies. Then the officer pointed to the church building. Go into the house and open all doors. The place is locked, I explained. I'll have to get the keys. He nodded permission and I sighed and with relief as I turned back into the kitchen. I felt that one storm had been weathered. I returned with the keys and came down the steps. The throng of soldiers parted to allow me to pass along with the officer at my heels to the other building. On his instructions I went from room to room opening every cupboard for him to peer in. When returning to the smaller building, the carpenter, Rosa and Susanna were summoned for questioning. I remember how Susanna, imperturbable as ever, made of her interrogation an opportunity to give the Reds a lesson in religion, explaining calmly and clearly what it was and what it meant to her. Meanwhile, more soldiers were pouring into the grounds, and with them came another officer to whom we were now handed over. He was of higher rank than the other, and also more friendly. He took me on a second tour of the premises. In the church we sat at the harmonium and played snitches of several classical melodies. The inspection over, he asked if he could quarter soldiers in the main building for the night. I pointed out that this was a church and that churches were not usually taken over for that purposes. I'm sorry, he said. But all large buildings have already been taken and still were short room. We'll have, to ta we'll have to have it. Then I heard the first of many promises North Korean officials have made me. I noticed the fine polished floor of the church. I'll say that the soldiers take their boots off and that they don't do any looting. Well, this first promise was ful fulfilled 50%, better than most of the others I have been given since. The soldiers, as it happened, did take off their boots. Before leaving, the soldier asked me, you'll be all right, only don't leave the church grounds. A third soldier came to ask if we had drinking water on the premises. I showed him the pump in the kitchen. He pumped some water and he had me taste it. Fine, he said, pump some and give it to the soldiers. We collected large vessels and for over an hour the carpenter, Suzanne and I pumped water while a procession of soldiers filed past the kitchen door carrying the, ves the filled vessels away and bringing them back for rep replenishment. Next morning, Friday, June 30th, celebration of the Mass was out of the question. When at length the soldiers left the church building, I went to inspect it. Some things had been taken fountain pens, clocks, a radio, a portable sewing machine, a camera, and such like. To facilitate selection, the looters had thrown the contents of suitcases on the floor and spread them out. This morning, the dead town of yesterday was alive with soldiers. They seemed to emerge from every house in the town, and some came streaming in from every nearby valley where there were houses. A little later, more still came pouring in along the main roads from the northeast and the northwest. I watched the procession that came down from the northwest road from Chuncheon. First came the inventory, in disorderly groups. Then came men riding horses, pedal cycles and motorcycles. Vehicles of every conceivable kind rolled into the town. Carts and wagons drawn by oxen, mules and horses. Old Japanese trucks carrying supplies new Russian ones towing artillery, cars, jeeps, tanks, large and small, ancient and modern. It was a motley collection, not very impressive in terms of modern warfare, except for its size. 
the troops that came on and on in this strange cavalcade were very numerous and also looked very determined. For the best part of a week, I suffered no serious interference, except for the, that first morning when the church was occupied by troops. I was able to say Mass each day. I did so in the sacristy, very early. Evacuees who had not gone far began to creep back into the town. Among them some Christians, and a few of the more courageous came along to Mass. I had numerous visits, of course, from official interviewers, and some search parties. When one set of visitors came on the heels of another, I would point out that their work had already been done, but the answer was always the same. We belong to a different department and must therefore satisfy ourselves. Then there was the problem of trying to protect the church property and my own. It was a waste of energy, as later events proved but it was natural that I would do my best at the time. On the first morning, the sound of frantic cackling took me to the fowl house. I found a pair of young soldiers cheerfully wringing the necks of my pullets. They seemed surprised to see me and desisted. They explained they were very hungry and went off with a couple of corpses apiece. I returned to find two stalwarts emerging from the church with hands full of candles. Several times I answered a distress call from Susanna and found her trying to bar the way to the larder against invaders. I adopted the policy of keeping all doors locked during the day except the kitchen door and of spending most of my time seated on the back steps of the church building. From there I could see the kitchen door and it was as good a station as any for keeping an eye on the would-be visitors to, each, to either the church building or the kitchen block. Staying outside I found... I had a further advantage. Soldiers who came out of curiosity and not unauthorised business would usually accept my invitation to sit and chat. Then, after they had done a little window peeking, they would often be content to leave, whereas if they got indoors, they would generally see something that took their fancy. They were mostly simple country lads. Their heads had been filled with propaganda against everything Western and everything religious. But the majority proved friendly enough when they found I was human. A few were openly hostile. One told me vehemently that he would not rest until every foreigner had been killed or driven from the country and all traces of religion removed. A few days after the Northerners arrived, I received a visit from a grief-stricken girl who told me a story that reflects badly on the Southern police. In these pages, references to the Northern police will be frequent and rarely favourable. It should be in justice be stated that the standard of police behaviour in the South also, as I saw it in the period between the expulsion of the Japanese and the outbreak of the present North-South struggle, fell far below the standard that demands of high responsibilities involved. The Japanese admittedly had bequeathed a bad police tradition to the whole country. Another major factor of the problem was the gross inadequacy of police salaries. A pittance hardly sufficient to cover the purchase of winter fuel is unlikely to attract many recruits of intelligence and ability, and those who do accept it must be men of exceptional idealism, who are either to resist the temptation to supplement their income by misuse of their powers. The girl's story was this. Her brother had been among a score of men arrested in Hong Chan as suspected communists when the, the first news of the invasion arrived. Shortly before the Reds reached the town, these men had been taken away by truck. They would be lodged, the police said, in jail further south. The, the bodies of half of them were now being found in the mountains. Their hands had been tied behind their backs and there were bullet holes in their heads. The fate of the other half of the party, which included the girl's brother, was unknown. I had known her brother well, an intelligent, industrious and very likeable boy. The only association with communism, I believe, had been a short period soon after the end of the Japanese rule in Korea, a period when communist propagandists were active in the south as well in the north. He had thought for a time that communism was perhaps the answer to the social evils he saw before him. He was soon disillusioned. 
but not before the interest in communism had been noted by the police. Thereafter, whenever disturbances were caused by communist activity, he was arrested and jailed, as a matter of course, till the crisis passed. It was classic instance of give a dog a bad name. He had long since realised that in Christianity, not communism, lay the solution to social problems he deplored. Some months before his last arrest, he had completed a course of Christian instruction and had been received into the church. The history of his change of view was a common knowledge in the town. There were, however, many genuine friends of communism living in the town who proclaimed their allegiance openly as soon as the northerners arrived. Three of these gentry, two men and a woman, paid me a visit on July 5th. They wore red armbands of authority and were accompanied by an unproposing little man beneath whose coattail I could see the muzzle of a large pistol. I was to meet this little man again and soon. On this occasion, however, he seemed less interested in me than in my furniture, which he proposed to select items suitable for the police station. That, he said, gesturing magnificently towards the icebox, would suit our purpose fine. I suspect he thought it was a filing cabinet. End of chapter 2 Under the Red Star